Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, and we are back with the next chapter of Homecoming by Cynthia Voigt. This looks like a longish chapter, so I think I'm probably just going to read half of it today and half of it tomorrow or whenever I film next, because I don't like to make these too, too long or feel rushed or have to worry that they're going to get cut off in the middle. But this is part two, chapter eight, part one. Yeah, you got that. Okay. Slowly, Daisy turned. She looked all around the room before she answered. She didn't know what she should say. Why should she say anything? She'd been told to go away. Sunlight poured into the kitchen through the door and windows, so her grandmother had kept the honeysuckle down on this side of the house. It was a long, bright, plain room, the kitchen. Everything in it looked old and scrubbed like the top of the table. Wooden counters, wooden cupboards, wooden chairs, wooden floor. Only the refrigerator, sink, and stove were porcelain. A single light hung down over the table. It had a pale yellow glass hood over it. Her grandmother sat without moving, staring at Dicey. Then who am I? Dicey asked. I knew the minute you knocked on the door. That's why I came outside. A polite person would have gone away. Her grandmother waited to see what Dicey would say. Dicey didn't say anything. Oh, I know who you are. You're the oldest one. I can't remember your name. There's a foolish letter here somewhere. It has all your names in it. This wasn't good enough. You don't know who I am, Dicey said. You're Liza's daughter, some ungodly name she gave you, her and that Francis. I liked him, I did. Who's the letter from, Dicey asked. Connecticut, her grandmother answered. Where are the rest of you? One's retarded, the letter said. Maudlin, simpering fool. Can't blame her, though. Her mother simpered, simpered and looked in mirrors all her life. She's dead now. My sister Scylla, she's dead too. Is she retarded? No, Dicey said, not that it concerns you. You're right. It doesn't concern me one whit. Did you ditch him somewhere? Dicey could follow her grandmother's thoughts easily now, now that she knew the woman, what the woman was talking about. They're waiting for me in town. We've got a place to go. Back to that one? Maybe, Dicey said. She was angry now. This grandmother. Dicey wouldn't give two pins to satisfy her curiosity. If this grandmother had known all along... A polite person would have pretended not to know me, Dicey said. Never said I had good manners, her grandmother said. Never had any manners to say anything about. Her grandmother seemed pleased. My name's Dicey, Dicey said. That's right, her grandmother said. I remember now. It was in the letter. I'm not crazy. I know, Dicey said. I'm going now. Suit yourself. Where are you all sleeping? We're moving on. We don't need a place to stay. Don't you lie to me, girl. If you didn't need a place to sleep, you wouldn't have traipsed out here this morning. You wouldn't have come back around to find me. You wouldn't have asked Millie. Did you tell her who you were? No, Dicey said. Her anger flamed up again. No, why should I? We can't stay here. You said so. So there's no point in hanging around. I've got my family to get back to. I said sleep. There's no reason not to sleep here, is there? Yes, Dicey said. I think there is. Why should James and Maybeth and Sammy have to be disappointed? I'm family, too, her grandmother said. She took the bowls from the table and walked over to the sink. And I can hear what you're thinking, girl. Dicey hoped she couldn't. So you sleep here, all of you, because you have no place else to go. We do, too, Dicey said. Then why did you come here? Can you answer me that? Dicey's lips were tight. Her grandmother's lips were tight. They glared at one another across the kitchen. Neither one of them faltered. Then her grandmother's lips twitched and spilled out laughter. She cut the laughter off quickly, dried her hands on her skirt, and said to Dicey, Two of a kind we are. Poor Liza. Two of a kind. It was the laughter that undid Dicey. How could you be angry at someone who was laughing? Okay, she said, but... But what? Be nice to them? Nicer than I was to you? Yeah, Dicey said. I'm not promising anything, her grandmother said. Let's get going. She led the way out to the back. Dicey turned toward the dilapidated barn where the truck must be, but her grandmother headed straight off to the fields. Her feet must have leathered soles, Dicey thought, as they crossed through the vegetable gardens on a dirt path. I don't have a car, her grandmother said over her shoulder. She moved like a young woman, long, strong strides, her arms hanging easy at her sides. Not since he died. I always hated them. I never learned to drive. The path crossed between two long, well-kept fields, mostly tomatoes and corn, but other crops too, squashes and beans, and entered the marsh grass. Dicey followed her grandmother. However bad the rest of the farm, the barn, and the house looked, her grandmother had worked on these fields. A steady wind blew, causing the grasses to bow and whisper among themselves. Ahead, Dicey saw open water. 
The bay lay at the farm's edge. The path led up to a dock built of weathered gray wood. At the end of it was tied a long open boat. It had an outboard motor and four seats. It was at least 15 feet long and painted a bright red inside and out. The boat looked taken care of, too. Daisy jumped in and sat on the center bench. Her grandmother untied the painter, pulled the boat around until its stern was near the dock, and jumped in herself, dropping the line into Daisy's lap. Coil that, she said, and turned to the motor. She pulled once on the starter. The motor hummed, and she headed the boat out into the bay. They couldn't have talked over the noise of the motor without screaming at one another, so Daisy didn't try. She sat with her back to her grandmother and watched the prow of the boat cut through the quiet water. She felt the fine spray the boat threw back, inhaled the salty air, and looked out to a horizon made only of sky and water. They followed the coastline, which was mostly marshes. Daisy saw few houses. Then they came into Crisfield Harbor, which was hidden behind a point of land. Shacks, bleached white by sunlight, leaned against one another. Piles of oyster shells made small pointed hills beside the shacks and behind them and in front of them. Daisy turned around and leaned toward her grandmother. They're on the farthest stock over, she called. Her grandmother nodded and yelled something back. Daisy couldn't hear her, and they didn't speak again. They chugged into the dock, tying up at the far end. Daisy scrambled out and hoisted herself up onto the boards. Her grandmother climbed up the wooden ladder. The dock was empty. There was no shade on it this time of day, so not even the old men remained. At first, as her eyes searched for her family, Daisy didn't worry about the dock being empty. Then she did. Where were they? She had told them to stay there. Where were they? What happened? Her eyes searched up the street to see the small, three small figures. Nobody moved on the sidewalks. They were gone. Daisy felt cold despite the heat of sunlight reflected off water. It was not the gentle breeze that cooled her. It was fear that froze. Not thinking, not caring whether her grandmother wanted to help at all, Daisy turned to her. I don't know, she said. You go up that side. Look in stores and restaurants. I'll go up this side. Daisy didn't wait to see if her grandmother started off. She ran, her heart pounding painfully. As she reached the end of the dock, she heard her name called. She swiveled around and saw Sammy running toward her from the shade behind one of the shacks across the harbor. Daisy's grandmother was right behind her. It's okay, Daisy said. That's Sammy. She was so relieved to see him that she ran across the crust, crushed oyster shells to meet him and caught at his hand. He let her hold it briefly, then pulled away. I told James, he said proudly. They walked back together. Told him what, Dicey asked. I didn't know where you were. I'll tell you, I was scared. J Sammy ignored that. Told him you'd be back. Where is he? Where's Maybeth? They walked out to the farm, James said. We should have all gone together anyway. He said you were wrong about that. We waited and waited. Then he said it was time to go, and I said no. And he said he'd thought it all over, and there was no good reason for you to go alone. He said I had to do what he said, and I said no. He said, you said to, and I said, you said to stay here and to, and do what he said, not go off because he said to, so he took Maybeth. By this time, they were back to where their grandmother waited. She listened, watching Sammy, watching Dicey. <clears throat> Sometimes I get so mad at James, Dicey said to Sammy, but I'm glad you stayed. How would I have known where they were? He thinks he's so smart. She turned to her grandmother, and he is smart, but I told them to stay here. I told them. She scuffed her foot in the shells. How was she going to catch up with James and Maybeth? What should she do now? Are you the grandmother? Sammy asked. Their grandmother nodded. When am I supposed to call you? Sammy asked. Dicey hadn't even thought of this. Neither apparently had their grandmother. She didn't answer Sammy. She pretended she hadn't heard him. Let's get back, she said. What about James and Maybeth? Dicey said. I can't just leave them. You already did, her grandmother said. They'll make their own way. It's what James wanted, isn't it? He'll find you. She headed back down the dock to the boat. Dicey followed. When they got back, if James and Maybeth weren't there, she'd walk back toward town. James wouldn't get lost. He'd listen to the directions, so he'd be on the right road. He didn't forget things. Sammy jumped down into the boat and climbed to the most forward seat. Dicey sat in the middle again, facing her brother. Behind her, she heard her grandmother untie the line and lower herself carefully from the ladder to the boat. Hold on to the dock, girl, she said to Dicey. Dicey stood up and reached out for a firm grip on the wood. As soon as the motor started, she pushed the boat away from the dock. Sammy leaned to her. Where is it? Dicey pointed south. A ways off, she said. What's it like, he asked. Run down. Are we going to stay? Dicey shook her head firmly. Just tonight. That's okay, Dicey, Sammy said. They were silent the rest of the way back to their grandmother's dock. 
The two children climbed out there. Daisy took the line and tied it around one post. Then she sat on the edge of the dock and held the boat steady with her feet while her grandmother lifted the motor up and rocked it into a resting position inside the boat. The metal propeller blades dripped water into the bay like sullen raindrops. Their grandmother led the way back to the fields and farm. Sammy walked behind her on the narrow path. Daisy came last, looking around over the waving fields of grasses, savoring the salty, muddy air. When they got past the fields, Daisy broke into a run. She sprinted across to the front of the house, hoping to see James's skinny figure sitting on the steps with Maybeth's quiet beside him. They weren't there. Sammy had followed her. Their grandmother had not. I'm going to find them, Dicey said. Do you want to come or stay? Stay, he said. She's not friendly, Dicey warned him. Neither am I, he said. Besides, I'll stay out here. James will be all right, Dicey. I hope so, she said. She loped down the long driveway without looking back. As Dicey emerged from the pine woods, she saw the two figures standing far off across the road by the mailbox. The brown grocery bag was on the ground between them. Dicey raised her hand in greeting and slowed to a walk. James picked up the bag. Daisy stopped. Let them come to her. She had a few things to say to James. His narrow face looked worried and relieved and ashamed and glad all at once. He was too smart to not, not to know all the things that could have happened. Sammy's alone downtown, James said before he said anything else. I'll go back and get him, if everything's okay. Daisy forgave him without a word, without another thought. Everything's not okay, but Sammy's here. She doesn't have a car. She uses a boat. That wasn't very smart, James. I thought it was when I started out. Well, don't worry. She doesn't want us to stay, but we can sleep here tonight. Then what? I don't know. Let me think about it. Why don't you come in? Were you there long? We couldn't see any house, Maybeth said. We didn't know what it would be like. They walked back together. As they came up to the house, Sammy called to them from up, from up among the leaves of the big tree. I was right, James, wasn't I? We went in a boat. How'd you get up there, James asked. J Sammy descended with a shivering of branches. He slid down the curve of one trunk and stopped himself just at the bottom where all four trunks came together. His legs were scratched. The children stood together at the base of the tree. The house was before them, overgrown with honeysuckle, dark windowed, looking abandoned. Off to the right, Dicey saw the lopsided barn. It had once been red, but the paint had weathered, faded, and peeled until it looked pink as a bad sunburn. The tin roof was rusted in large patches. I'm refraining to make a tin roof rusted comment. Okay, I had to. Um, anyway, Dicey said, this is where Mama lived. It's beautiful, Maybeth said. It's a wreck, Dicey answered. The field's out front, and look at that barn. It's gone to ruin. She hasn't taken care of it. But it's big, James said. Big enough for all of us. Is it near the water? There's a marsh first, Dicey said, a long, empty marsh, then the bay. There's a path, but the water's at least a quarter of a mile away, not like Provincetown. Anyway, who cares? We won't be staying. True enough, her grandmother said from the side of the house, but you'll be here for supper, so there's work to be done. I see you found them. She stared at James. James, she said. He tried to smile, but her face discouraged him. Her eyes flickered over Maybeth, and Maybeth. She looked away quickly as if nothing about Maybeth could interest her. The little girl moved closer to Dicey. I've got crab pots to set down by the dock, their grandmother said. Who'll fetch the crabs? I will, Dicey said. Me too, Sammy said. James and Sammy will, their grandmother announced. It's after four. I eat early and so will you. I put a basket by the back steps. The two boys ran off. You two come with me. I'll show you where to sleep. She strode around to the back of the house. Dicey picked up the grocery bag and followed her. Maybeth clung to Dicey's hand. They saw James and Sammy heading down, heading off down the path to the water. James carried a bushel basket by its two metal handles. Their grandmother led them through the kitchen and into a dim hallway. That's my room, she said, pointing at a closed door, and my bathroom, pointing to the closed door next to it. They turned left down the hall and ascended a narrow staircase. Upstairs, they saw a long, long U-shaped hallway with five closed doors around it. A window at one end looked out over the front yard through the leaves of the big tree. Their grandmother stood on the top step and let them go past her. That's the bathroom at the far end. Sheets are in one of the bureaus. I can't recollect which. Dicey went to look out the window. What kind of tree is that? Paper mulberry, her grandmother answered. Dainey no Dicey noticed from above, but could not be seen from below. There were strong, twisted wires running around the tree. 
Why is it wired? She asked. Because paper mulberries are fragile, her grandmother answered. It's the way they spread out at the top. It's the way they grow. If you didn't brace it, the weight of the leaves and the growing branches would pull the tree apart. Like families. She went abruptly downstairs. Stacy and Maybeth stood in the dim hallway. Cripe, Stacy whispered, like a ghost house. The air was warm and old, as if the same air had been up there for hundreds of years. The closed doors looked like so many secrets. Maybeth's eyes were round and frightened. Look at it this way, Maybeth. It's only for one night. And besides, this was Mama's house when she was little. Isn't that right? This didn't make Maybeth feel any better, but it made Dicey feel better. She forced up the old window to let in fresh air. She braced it with the piece of wood lying on the sill. Their grandmother wasn't going to take any trouble for them, but Dicey would show her. Dicey opened the nearest door and stepped boldly into the room. This was a bedroom with a plain iron bedstead overlaid with a thin white quilt. The pillow had no cover on it. The room held a dresser, a desk, a chair, and a wardrobe, all of plain wood. Dicey went to a window and snapped up the shade. This room faced the big tree. She snapped up a shade on the other wall and found a window that looked out to the barn. Between them, she and Maybeth got the four windows up and braced them with pieces of wood. Fresh air filtered around the room and the light came in. The smaller room across the hall was almost identical, except the quilt was faded blue instead of white. On the front of the wardrobe, somebody had painted a picture of Indians coming out of the woods, carrying bows and arrows, wearing war paint and bright headdresses. It was a kid's painting, with blobs of green paint for leaves and the sun like a yellow circle with lines coming out. Dicey liked it. They opened this room, too, and returned to the hall. With two doors open and the sunlight and the clean air, the upstairs seemed more friendly. Dicey walked down the wooden floor to the opposite end. First, she opened the door opposite the hall window. This was a bathroom. It had a toilet with a wooden seat and a wooden box above the seat, from which hung a long wooden-handled chain. The bathtub was raised off the floor by floor, floor by four stubby legs that ended at four feet with claws on them. The sink stood on a tall pedestal. Above it was a shelf where you could put soap and toothpaste. Dicey and Maybeth both went to the bathroom. They pulled on the chain to flush. When you flushed, you could hear the water gurgling down the pipes from the overhead box. Then Dicey opened the window and looked out. From this window, you looked over the roof of the porch, over the backyard, over the painted, the planted fields, over the long stretch of marshes to the water. The band of water lay blue and sparkling out and away. A boat, tiny at this distance, moved up the bay, maybe headed back to Crisfield with its day's catch. Dicey hurried into the room on the right. Here there were some small differences. There was the same iron bedstead and the quilt was multicolored, faded but still cheerful with reds and blues and greens and yellows. The bureau and wardrobe had been painted white. The desk and chair were plain wood. A picture hung on the wall, a childish picture of a boat sailing on blue water. Fish swam on the water, and crabs ran about the sandy bottom. Gulls wheeled, gulls wheeled in the air and rode with folded wings on the waves. Dicey snapped up the side shades and held these windows while Maybeth put the braces under them. These windows looked to the barn, but the other two windows, as she had hoped, gave out over the marsh and to the bay. The last bedroom had a ruffled quilt and pictures of ladies in old-fashioned dresses on the walls. Pictures cut out of magazines and pasted on a white background. The childish painter had put a picture on the wardrobe here, too, of a castle and town and a queen wearing an impossibly tall crown walking in the garden. Dicey hurried to, the open, to open the windows, one over the backyard and two to the piney woods that closed around the house. She turned to Maybeth. Well, this isn't bad, is it? Maybeth smiled quietly. It's only for a night. Let's each take our own room. Which do you think was Mama's? Sorry, guys, small interruption as usual. She turned to Maybeth. Well, this isn't bad, is it? Maybeth smiled quietly. It's only for a night. Let's each take our own room. Which one do you think was Mama's? This one, Maybeth said. Then you'll sleep in this one, okay? Maybeth nodded happily. They found the sheets in one of the front bedrooms and made up the beds together, folding hospital corners, plumping up the pillows. For herself, Dicey chose the other back bedroom because it looked to the water. There was nothing in any of the rooms to show that they had ever been lived in by anyone, but they must have been lived in by the three children, Mama and her brothers. None of their personalities had been left in the rooms except for the two paintings on the wardrobe doors, the lady cutouts, and the little picture of the boat. None of the children had wanted to stay here. They had all left home one way or the other, except the one who had died, maybe. 
you couldn't be sure he might have wanted to come back. All right, guys, I am going to pause here because there's still about 10 more pages in this chapter, and that might make it go on a little bit too long. So we'll read the second half of this chapter tomorrow. But I hope you guys enjoyed. Give it a thumbs up if you did. Feel free to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of future uploads. And have an awesome rest of your day. Thanks for listening. Bye.